Today's scripture is Revelation 3, 7 through 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Look, I have set before you an open door that no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but are lying. I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word of endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one takes away your crown. If you conquer, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. You will never go out of it. I will write on you the name of my God and the name of the city of my God the new Jerusalem that comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. Let anyone who has an ear to listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. We are in the middle of uh, Revelations. Actually, we're still in the beginning of Revelations, and we'll be here in, uh, in this for some time because I think it's, I, I just value that we go through, uh, if we're going to take a, on a book, we go through to where we can uh, enjoy the journey and, uh, and understand it. Revelations is one of those books that has often been uh, misunderstood. It's been used to scare people. Uh, it's been used to uh, strike up a lot of conspiracy theories and all of that stuff. And so I think it's important for us to, to, to go through this one. It's one that when I didn't really understand it early on in my life, I feared it. I didn't even want to read it. And so that's why... I, you know, I believe anything that's mentionable is manageable, so this is kind of our mentioning of this book so that we can get through it. Uh, we are in uh, the middle of the letters. We're actually on letter six. This is what's happening. Just a real quick catch-up. Uh, John is a, a disciple. He is preaching the gospel, and he gets uh, taken away and exiled to a small island called Patmos, and Patmos is just off the coast of Western uh, Turkey, Asia Minor. While he's there, he has an apocalypse. Apocalypse meaning uh, secrets of truth revealed. He has a revelation. And uh, he sees kingdoms. He sees imagery. He also sees Jesus. Jesus instructs uh, John to write these, uh, this letter of what he sees but also to write specifically seven letters to seven churches that are currently in Asia Minor. Uh, Philadelphia is in Asia Minor. It's not in the United States yet. Uh, this is actually what it looks like a bit of it today. Uh, it's a thriving community right now. It was, uh, but Philadelphia was founded in Antiquita. Uh, Antiquity? Antiquita? It was a long time ago. Can't speak that word today. Uh, it was conquered by the Ottomans in 1390. It's now called al It's this the, the ruins here that you see there, this is from a church called St. John. This is a homage to the, uh, the St. John that uh, we assume is writing this letter. Uh, and this is an inaccurate, uh, if you're looking for the church of that day, this is actually a church uh, ruins that was uh, of a church that was in existence about 100 years later. And so we don't have really any ruins of that specific church that John's writing to in 96 CE. Uh, we, um, the, 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 we'll talk about this a little bit uh, in a little bit, but uh, Philadelphia and the region, I including to, in times today, but back then they suffered a great deal of earthquakes. And so archaeologists continue to this day to dig uh, and find different uh, uh, different things, uncover different things, and all, all that kind of stuff. But a lot of it is buried under so much rubble. It's believed that this church may have even been built on top of a church because that was kind of the tradition at the time. So a lot of people think that the church that we're talking about is somewhere still under there. And so uh, I'll keep you posted if I hear anything. Um, now, 
the, the one thing, the reason that, that we hit on uh, this and the reason that we like to go through different passages from this is because, like I said, revelation is something that a lot of people have taken out of context and they have used it in, in uh, uh, bad ways. You can go down a lot of rabbit holes if you, if you type in different things from revelations. Uh, revel is revelation. I keep saying plural. It's actually revelation. Um, and the, uh, uh, there's some things in this letter. I'm just going to start out here uh, with some of the things that I want to point out. First off, he starts the letter, uh, these are the words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. Now, if you start out with that passage, you're going to find a lot of people that say, oh, there's codes to all of this stuff. What's the door and everything like that. If you ever are on a page and, you, and, and they start talking about the Bible as having secret codes, please move on because that is not uh, what the Bible intended. That actually has more um, in common with a group called Gnosticism where the, um, the early churches um, did not uh, acknowledge them they were, they were a church that, that wanted to make conspiracy theories and secretive and all of this kind of stuff as part of the worship of Jesus. That's not what this is about, and that's not what the Bible is about. So anytime that you see codes or anything like that, just uh, try to ignore it. We have to put ourselves in the first century. We have to go back in time and imagine the people, the original audience for this, we have to understand the culture. We have to understand what was going on. It's very, very important. And that's why it's so important for me to send us not only in that time, but to read the entire thing and not just pull snippets out of it and stuff like that. Because we can do damage with stuff like that. And I'll show you some of that stuff a little bit uh, later here. But when he talks about this saying, uh, you know, uh, these are the words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. Today, we look at that and we think, oh, that's mysterious. But the first uh, century church would have understood that greatly because they understood the Old Testament. He's talking about Isaiah 22, 22. I will place, it's almost exact. I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and no one shall shut. He shall shut and no one shall open. This is a time when the prophet Isaiah is uh, confronting uh, kings that were self-focused and not worshiping God. And he's saying, the, this, the key of the kingdom that you think that you have will be taken away from you. And I'm not just talking about the door to some building. I'm talking about the, the kingdom of God. And so uh, there are rulers throughout time that God allows, but sometimes God doesn't approve. This is one of those times where God is saying, this person's thinking about themselves, he's not thinking about me, and Isaiah comes in to confront. And so we have to understand that Jesus is always about setting things right. Uh, not about condemnation or punishment, but setting things right. Uh, Jesus will find this, uh, uh, Revelation is going to get weird, and it's gonna get, we're going to go down a, a road there where you're just going to go, that's weird. Um, but I want to put the theme right into your head here. Jesus' fight, this whole book, the theme is God overtaking evil. It's God overtaking evil in the final, the final blow, just finally getting over with it. Jesus at this time knows that we live, just as they did in the first century, that we're all living in this time where evil still exists. Okay, And this is another example of where he's talking about when we pull ourselves away from God, we pull ourselves away from all of those things. And so it's all about this journey of setting things right. And that's what he's talking about there. So and that's one thing that's been used as a mystery that we have solved. So uh, congratulations. Uh, I feel like Matlock up here. <laughs> I know that you have, this is another one, I know that you have but little power yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. The funny thing about this letter is that in, if you've been joining us and if you want to look back and catch up, you can go through our YouTube page and, and find all of, the, all of the ways up here. But this is one, a, a letter that he's not criticizing them. Uh, a lot of the letters he says, you know, you're doing some good stuff, but here's the things that I have a problem with. With Philadelphia, he doesn't have a problem with it. 
That's why the town you know, in America named themselves Philadelphia and not one of the other churches that he had a problem with. You know, you don't want to do that as your lineage. You know, you want to want the one that he bragged about to be the one that you name a city after. And that's what they, the people of Philadelphia are doing the right things according to Jesus. But he knows that they have issues that have happened to them. Uh, he knows that they are small. Now, um, Imagine yourself in first century Philadelphia. There are, uh, there's, there's pagans around. There, there are uh, temples to the, the, the cult of the empire and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, there are also a, a pretty large Jewish community, several thousand uh, Jewish people. And they all have uh, buildings, structure. They have temples that they worship. It's a thriving Jewish community. Now, an offset of those Jewish people have accepted Christ as their Savior. And they are now part of this church. This church has no building. This church meets in a house. Uh, this church, how many, how many folks do we have here? Did anyone take account of our attendance today? 57. We're bigger than the church in Philadelphia. Congratulations. Congratulations. Because that church, at the time that, Paul, or that uh, John is writing to them, they had two, threes pushing it, dozen people. That's it. We're talking about maybe 30. Uh, there, was, there was room in the home when they met. Uh, and this is their surroundings. They are surrounded by thousands of Jewish people. And they, for the most part, uh, for the, they are Jewish. Uh, they are Jewish descent. They are of that lineage. They grew up with all of the folks that surround them. But now they're the outcast, and they're a small number. They seem quite insignificant. If you walked in there, you would probably just not even know that they were there. You would ignore them. Except for the fact that the other people around them continue to haunt them, persecute them, bully them. Some of the members of the church have gotten uh, prosecuted for preaching this faith. Some of the members have gotten uh, beaten up because of their faith. They are surrounded by a group of people that not only want to uh, stop them from growing, they want to just stop them. And so every day they are feeling this, uh, uh, this sense of, of, of bulliness and all of this stuff, outnumbered. Uh, they're feeling pretty insecure at this time as a church. Uh, they're a small church. How do, we, how do we even make it in this community? What are we doing in this community? We are so small. We have nothing. We're not going to survive. And this is, a, this is something I want to say about people that when he, when he says that uh, you are small, he's trying to tell them that on the outside you are small, but you are large because of me. You are worth it because of me. There's a reason that Jesus is actually writing. Now, this is Jesus. And he's writing a letter to a church of 30. You would think that, oh, he's going to wait for those mega churches so that he can say something that will be shown on the big screen. But he's reaching out to this group that feels very insignificant because he's telling them you are significant. You are so important that your story will be shared for 2,000 years in a church called Neighbors. You will hear this story because this church mattered. That's what we have to hang on to, and that's what we have to listen for. And all the small churches that are out there, I want you to hear me. You matter to Jesus. You matter. He knows the things are hard and things are going against you at times, but you make a difference, so much so that it's in this book in 96 CE of this church must stay the course, must stay the course. Now we get into some damaging words here. He says, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but are lying I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. 
This is one of those out of context things that hate groups of all kinds have used to say, see, God doesn't like Jews. So we shouldn't like Jews either because they're the synagogue of Satan. Again, we're pulling stuff out of context. And again, we have to put ourselves in the first century. This is not a Christian versus Jew thing at all. Christianity was not at this, this time even really known as Christianity. It was for many of the folks that were in this church in Philadelphia, it was Jewish. Jesus was the answer to the prophecy. He was the chosen one. They didn't change their faith. They just kept going in it. That's it. And they have an argument with other Jewish people that don't believe that Jesus is the answer to the Messiah. And they're outnumbered. And the people that are arguing with them are being pretty mean. But it's not a, a Christian versus Jew thing. It's an infighting in a community thing. Again, I've said this before because this has been said in another letter before. We can relate to that because we have Christians fighting each other all the time. And it's not us versus them type of thing. It's Jesus saying, some of you are out of line. And some of you will be made aware. You don't believe it now, but you will be made aware that I am God. I am the one. He's encouraging this small group of 30 people that keep going because what you are believing, what you are following, what you are living out, even under persecution, you are right. I want you to know you're right. I am, I am who you say I am. And I want you to remember that. You're a small group, but I am with you. And someday, this church, the people around you, will understand that so much that they will drop to their knees because they will realize it too. But right now, you're the one that's carrying that torch. You're the one that's got to keep that message going. You're the one that really is significant here. You're the one that has the power here. And Jesus, again, remember I said, this is all about putting evil in its place. He doesn't say, and Tom's really being a jerk. He says, the synagogue of Satan. In other words, they are being controlled by some evil here. They are being sucked in to something wicked. And I'm going to set this right. Revelation is not a condemnation, it's a saving, it's a rescuing, it's all about encouragement. And for the people of a church that small to think that they even are acknowledged, Jesus is saying, not only do you, I acknowledge you, he says, if you conquer, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. You will never go out of it. This is significant, too, for the people there because there's, there's two reasons that this mattered to them. The first, they, in Philadelphia, I said that they had earthquakes. They had a massive one 50 years before this uh, book was written, this letter was written. A massive one. All the structures were totaled. This is why they're still digging them out. If we had something that happened uh, here that was that devastating, 50 years is nothing. We would still be seeing remnants of that. I remember Grand Island having a massive uh, tornado, and we saw the devastation of that years later because they were still rebuilding and the people still remembered it. So the people of Philadelphia that he's getting, giving this letter to, they understand because around them they saw all kinds of temples and buildings and pillars fall. But he's saying, you're going to be part of the pillars of strength that hold things together. You're going to be part of that rebuilding. The other reason that makes a lot of sense to them is because the early church founders, I'm talking about the, those, those disciples, you know, the ones in Jerusalem, when, when Jesus ascended, they, they considered themselves the temple. They, the temple was no longer there. The temple was Jesus, and now Jesus is part of us, so we're pillars of that. And they were referred to that way, too. It was a metaphor of how strong they were to build this church. 
Now remember, this is an insignificant church all the way in Philadelphia here, and they're thinking, but wait a minute, those founders, those were the big guys. We're really nothing. And Jesus is saying, hey, with me, there is no big guy and nothing. It's all of you. And you're going to be part of that. You're going to be the pillars of that kingdom. You are going to be significant because you are significant. This is Jesus reaching out and doing what Jesus does to people that do not think that they are that important. And he's saying, you are. Just like he's saying it to us today. We are important in that kingdom building. He says, I will write on you the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. Ooh, what's the new name? That's where we go down those codes again and people say, oh, I think his name is Frank because it all means this. And if you add two and four and all this kind of stuff, don't listen to any of that stuff. Again, the first century, they knew what they were talking about. They knew exactly what he was talking about. The new name, he's talking about kingdom and earth. Just like the song that we were playing before, when earth and heaven become one, when the rebuilding, when we see things transformed and everything is made new again. They knew what he, they were talking about. There was nothing mysterious about these letters at all to them. And when they talk about the new name of Jesus, it's the name that they were calling him all along. Lord. He wasn't just Jesus. He wasn't just a prophet. He was Lord to them. We said it in the baptism. That's the name. One day, all of us will be part of that kingdom, and we will see that Christ is Lord. So that's the mystery of that. That is the mystery solved. Um, but there's something about this story that still breaks my heart. And I still think it's one of those that we can relate to. Remember, this was meant to be written and uh, read by seven churches. But even in the first century, it was then they would take those letters, they would transcribe them, they would share them with all of the churches. And it was meant for all churches to read these letters. And it was meant for all the churches throughout the generations to read these letters. So we are today fulfilling what Paul's call or what John's call was. We are reading his letter. Again, put yourself in that first century. You've got about 30 people, and most of them are Jewish. The people they're being persecuted from, the people that are uh, bullying them and trying to prevent them from growing, are people that they knew for all their lives. When you shared a faith, when you shared an uh, something like that. It, it was family. And what we're witnessing here is a case where family is broken up. And this is not something that Christ wants. This is why Christ says, you know, at one time they will come and they will bow to you because they will know that I am love and all of this stuff. But right now, yeah, they are being run by something quite evil and Right now, they are not going to be, there's not going to be a reconciliation right now. There, there's separation right now. We, we live under this delusion sometimes, especially we're coming up on the holidays. We live under this delusion sometimes that we are called to get along with everybody. When the Bible tells us again and again that sometimes that just doesn't happen. We're, we're to love everybody. We are to love everybody, but sometimes, sometimes we're separated. And I know, I just want to acknowledge that as we go into the holidays, I know that there are people right here that have friction. The holidays to them are something that just kind of brings up anxiety. They get the little hair sticking up on the back of their neck, and they worry about whether or not they're going to talk about a certain subject or anything like that, or whether that person's going to be there, or if they can just get through this, they start watching the clock when they pull into the driveway. And some of them, they just don't get together at all. Some of us, we are at uh, a crossroads with family, where we've gone our separate ways. 
Jesus understands that. It's a reality of where we are now. Because remember, we were slaves to sin. We wait for the second coming. And right now, we are in this weird mix where the water has been dirtied. The water has been diluted. And we have things that we have to deal with. Remember, if we're following revelations, this means evil. And one of the things that evil brings is uh, discomfort, fear, anger, and it also brings separation and fights. Some of us around this time, we're fighting over politics. Some of us, we fight about things that are so much deeper and have gone so back so many years. I just want to acknowledge that that is something that Jesus understands. It's written in Scripture. It's happening to the church in Philadelphia. One of the things that we don't mention is that, yes, they're being threatened and they're being influenced and all this stuff, but they are also grieving. Their love for Christ means a separation from people that they may have loved all their lives. Some of it is family. Some of it might be siblings. And they're not together anymore. And they're hurting. And Jesus knows that. Just as he knows it then, he knows it now. That there are many of us that are hurting because we can't have the family that we want. I was at coffee with uh, a good friend. His family is so close. They are wonderful. He loves it when they all get together. Siblings, everything. I said, I, I'm so happy for you. I, I don't know what that's like. Be grateful that you have it. Even as your pastor, who is supposed to have some answers... Uh, I have separation from my family, too. I have people that I haven't talk, talked to for years. And I have people that, when we do talk, it is, um, it's, not, it's not smooth, you know? Uh, there are things that have been done on both sides for so many years. I don't know if anybody even has the right answer of, of what went wrong. But I do know that there are holidays that, and get-togethers that uh, for years I, I've not attended. And so I get that. It hurts. It never stops hurting. I have a family member that is very, very, very close to me. Or was. I've known this family member since birth. We don't talk. And I found out this week that he's dying. I've also been told I can't visit him. It's devastating. But I know I'm not the only one. I'm not even the only one in this room that is experiencing something like this and working through it. And Jesus knows. Just like the church in Philadelphia, that some of us are grieving. And he says, you might, you might think that this is small. You might think that this is insignificant. But I want you to know, I am here with you. And you may not experience it now. You may not experience it in what you define as maybe your lifetime. But I want you to know that things will be made right. Stay the course. Things will be made right. And if I need proof of that, because sometimes you do, I look at you guys. One of the reasons why we're here as a church is the same reason that the church, those 30 people in Philadelphia were, to be there for each other, to understand the grief, to 
to live through it, to understand that God is with us, to remind each other of that, and to show it with each other. That's why we pray together. We're not trying to steer God, and I don't believe that God uh, causes all things to happen, including all the bad things. This is a fight between good and evil. Christ works to correct that and promises us that one day it will be a victory. We're here to pray for each other, to show support for each other, to be for each other, to understand each other. We cry on each other's shoulders. We celebrate together. We mourn together. For those of you that don't have a family, I hope you look around. Your brothers and sisters are here. And if you do have a family that you celebrate with, God bless you. Take hold of them and love them as God loves you. Would you pray with me? Dear God, we give thanks for everything that you have given us. We give thanks for all that you are in the chaos, in the sadness, in the yelling, in the screaming, in the separation. Remind us, you've never left us. Let us hear your voice today. Maybe it's through a song, maybe it's through each other, however it is. Remind us you're there. And remind those that we may be separated from too that you love them as well. And may we continue to love all. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. I know that the people of Philadelphia would have hard days. They'd have hard weeks. And I bet they looked forward to every time that they gathered. It's been a tough week for me as it has been for some of you. Thank God we have this church. Love God, love yourself, love your neighbor. And I mean that.